Today, we're closer than ever to knowing the answer. Some scientists believe we'll get our first look at our extraterrestrial cousins in the near future. I hope it's in the next 10 years, and I'm ready for it next week. So, <laughs> the sooner the better. What's more, we could find these aliens not on distant planets in unexplored galaxies, but right next door in our own solar system. Scientists are now honing in on proof that ET is out there and living on the most hazardous of worlds. Our safari will journey to seven destinations in our solar system to see just where these creatures could be and what they might look like. These exotic lands are unimaginably harsh. Life as we think of it would perish in an instant. But alien life may be far tougher than we expect, as we're learning from a surprising group of living things right here on Earth. Until just a few decades ago, we were sure our planet was unique. It is the only one we've found so far that has nurtured the evolution of millions of species. Thanks to its abundant sunshine, warm water, and protective atmosphere. We logically concluded that life needed each of those things, a conclusion that ruled out all other known worlds in our solar system. But then, biologists began combing some of the Earth's darkest and coldest places. And to their surprise, they found living, breathing creatures. Biologists call these organisms extremophiles. Some don't need light or oxygen. Others survive in tremendous atmospheric pressure. It seems life can turn up practically anywhere. Take Antarctica. After years of searching this arid, frozen landscape, scientists doubted they'd find anything alive. But in 1999, a team of explorers unearthed a rock from six feet under the ice. What they found amazed them. When they cracked the rock open, they found it teeming with tiny creatures. Here, at temperatures of 68 degrees below zero and six feet under solid ice, life had found a foothold. Biologists have been increasingly discovering life, not kangaroos, but, you know, simpler forms of life that live at very cold temperatures, very high temperatures, very great pressures, even in places where there's sort of a high degree of radiation. It turns out life is able to live in a much wider variety of environments on our own planet than we used to think. And if life can survive extreme conditions, not just here at home, but elsewhere in our solar system, think of what this could mean. Unless there's something extraordinarily miraculous about our solar system or our planet, then life has got to be extremely commonplace. I mean, there's got to be large numbers of worlds with life. And some of them would have cooked up intelligent life. In the beginning, our Earth was as deadly a planet as any. Over the first billion years of Earth's existence, cosmic debris pummeled it mercilessly. The impacts turned its surface into a broiling, seething inferno where life was impossible. But once the solar system settled down and the Earth began to cool, water appeared, setting the stage for life. In 1953, researcher Stanley Miller proved in a lab experiment just how easily life on Earth got its start. He combined water with hydrogen, methane and ammonia, components of the Earth's early atmosphere. Then he zapped his solution with an electric charge to simulate lightning. 
His results shocked the world. Miller had created organic molecules called amino acids, the protein building blocks of all living things. If lightning helped jumpstart life on Earth, could it have done the same on other planets? Galactic probes have now found the ingredients in Miller's experiment throughout our solar system, including one essential to life. One of the requirements that every form of life that we know about on Earth has, every single one, is liquid water. We've used evidence for liquid water to kind of guide our search for habitable environments. Our safari is headed to seven worlds, some possibly rich in water, where scientists believe aliens might be hiding. While any life there might have begun much like life on Earth, how it looks now is anyone's guess. We begin in the world that has always fired our imaginations, the planet right next door, Mars. Of all the planets where we've looked for life, it's the one we've studied most. The scientist who may get the first look at Martians, if they're found, is Steve Squires, principal investigator for NASA's Mars rovers. Mars has always had among all the planets, I think, a special fascination for, for humans. For a very long time, we've known enough about Mars to know that it is probably the most Earth-like. It may be the most like Earth, with an atmosphere and seasons, but we humans would perish quickly on Mars. Its air is thin, 40 times thinner than the air at the top of Mount Everest and it sits in a bad neighborhood of our solar system, near an asteroid belt. Its atmosphere is too flimsy to protect it. Asteroids continually bombard its surface. Violent winds can whip Mars's sandy soil into storms that consume the entire planet for weeks and spawn tornadoes eight kilometers high. Midday temperatures at the equator of one degree Celsius fall to minus 70 at night. David Grinspoon is a curator of astrobiology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. As he sees it, Mars would be warmer if it wasn't a planetary runt. When I grab coffee on a cold morning, I know that a small espresso is going to cool off quickly, whereas a larger coffee is going to stay warm much longer. Large objects stay warm longer because their interiors are shielded from the outside where the cooling occurs. And planets are exactly the same way. A small planet will cool off early in its history. A larger planet like Earth will stay warm for billions of years, which makes it a better place probably to look for life. Despite Mars's drawbacks, it has always fascinated scientists because its terrain seemed to give evidence that it might support life. Its dynamic landscape of mountains, volcanoes, and deep ravines is not unlike our Earth. To early astronomers, these features look like oceans and rivers, and even a system of canals, supposedly not just supporting life, but actually produced by it. Percival Lowell in the United States uh, observed these things and inferred that, in fact, these were, things were so straight and so regular in geometry that they had to have been the product of intelligent life, okay? Well, he was right. The problem was the life was at the wrong end of the telescope. In viewing this thing visually through a telescope eyepiece, the, the human eye-brain combination started to connect things that weren't really there. Lowell was not alone. Some scientists were shocked when the probe Viking 1 beamed back this image. Is that a human face? perhaps produced by Martians in their own likeness? Until recently, we've never really known where to look in our solar system for extraterrestrial life. But we've always known what the aliens would be like once we found them. Consciousness. 
Usually, there is more than a hint of the Earthling in our aliens. Hostile or lovable, they tend to resemble mutant images of ourselves. As a senior astronomer at the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute in California, Seth Shostak has spent his career listening for the radio waves of a distant alien society. There's no reason to assume that they're going to look like us or even think like us or behave like us or have language. You know, you just have to look at the variety of life on Earth and you see that, you know, nature can come up with lots of different forms. But if there is life on Mars, how could it survive in such extreme conditions? Since the 1960s, scientists have sent dozens of probes to the Red Planet. The first pictures of the barren landscape quickly dashed any hope of finding intelligent beings. But what scientists did see startled them. Though there's no evidence of Martian-made canals, there are signs that Mars actually may have had water. Some think the angry red planet might once have been blue. You just have to look back a couple of billion years, three and a half billion, four billion years ago, Mars had a thicker atmosphere, had water on its surface clearly, maybe it developed life. And as it slowly went bad, you know, the life had to adapt. Life may have adapted, not died off, because some liquid water may still exist underground. But with no surface water, frigid temperatures, and ultra-thin atmosphere, Mars is a planet only one kind of creature could love an extremophile. Extremophiles thrive in the cruelest of places. To see where they might lurk on Mars, we head to the Valles Marineris, a massive rift in Mars's surface, 20 times wider than the Grand Canyon in places, and almost as deep as Mount Everest is tall. Lakes may have once flooded this valley. And those lakes could have hosted life. As the water dried up, life could have evolved to cope with the harsher environment. We won't know what these extremophiles are like until we find them. But they may resemble creatures that exist in extreme places right here on Earth. An unusual team of biologists, called astrobiologists, study Earth for the kinds of life we may find in outer space. Astrobiologist Rocco Mancinelli is on the hunt for Mars's extremophiles. If it went beneath the surface, and some of it undoubtedly did, then what happened to it? Well, it formed brine pockets. So what kind of organism can live in a salty brine? A salt-loving organism. Astrobiologist Chris McKay thinks he knows the kind of salt-loving creatures that might survive on Mars. Creatures much like those he's found in one of the driest, saltiest places on Earth. The fundamental challenge to life on Mars is, in a sense, the fundamental challenge of life here in Death Valley. It's dryness. That is the hardest thing for life to adapt to. Thousands of years ago, a salty lake covered Death Valley just as lakes filled Mars's Mariner Trench. Move in closer. This is still wet, a little wet. This appears like a lifeless place, a big, flat, white, empty horizon. But yet, just below the surface, we find layers of algae and bacteria growing. They're living in a, an environment that in many ways is fundamentally different from the environment that we sense on the surface. Here you're in a place which looks lifeless, looks dead, and yet you dig down and hidden underneath, there it is. Beneath the salt is a layer of hardy green algae that survive on the water and light that trickle through. The algae in turn feed salt-loving microorganisms. Here in deserts on Earth, dried, salty lake beds, we're going to find them on Mars as well. 
salty deserts are not the only places life might be hiding on the red planet. There are Mars's tremendous volcanoes, some of them six times larger than those on Earth. Astrobiologist Penny Boston studies the caves, called lava tubes, left over after volcanic lava has dissipated. Not long ago, we assumed caves like these were devoid of life. They get no sunlight, and no sunlight means no photosynthesis. But in lava tubes outside Albuquerque, New Mexico, Boston has found evidence of extreme life. Because we know Mars has many, many lava tubes. And so here we have the opportunity to see how these formed and also to look at the life that inhabits them. The extremophiles Boston has found appear to be thriving. They get their energy by feeding on the minerals in the cave wall. So here we're up close to the wall and you can see these white patches here growing against the black basalt. And each one of these is like a major city for these little guys. And they're, you know, they're all nestled in these little pockets in the basalt. And so these guys are permanently adapted to these freezing temperatures. Uh, they never see any light and they get uh, what they can find in the environment. Are there creatures like these in the caves below Mars's volcano fields? Boston thinks so. We are going to find life, and I just hope that I live a long and healthy life so that I can still be around to see that. We may already have had our first glimpse of Martians, not from our visit to their planet, but from their visit to ours. 16 million years ago, an asteroid slammed into Mars and propelled a two kilogram rock into space. Amazingly, that rock sailed to Earth and came to rest in Antarctica. Inside, NASA scientist David McKay and Everett Gibson were amazed to spot the outlines of fossils. Water has carved small tunnels in the rock. And in these tunnels, McKay and Gibson found what they believe to be evidence of bacterial life. These are little microbes, and they're dead, and they're, they're fossils, or in some cases, we don't even see the forms. We see the footprints or the evidence that they were there. Life from Mars? Maybe. The hunt is only just beginning. NASA plans to send a rover called Phoenix to Mars. It will study the planet's ice cap and probe three feet beneath the surface. NASA even has a plan to send human visitors. They may not meet the little green men of our imaginations, but they could encounter life in some form. What will it look like? It is likely to be a subterranean dweller with an ability to survive on little water. Perhaps an organism with a taste for minerals like the creatures in the lava tubes of New Mexico. Even the smallest find would have enormous implications. Proof that life is not unique to Earth, but exists just next door. Our safari to the places in our solar system likely to harbor alien life now takes us past the asteroid belt on the far side of Mars. Here, Jupiter reigns. But this planet, the largest in our solar system, is fairly hostile to life, thanks to its toxic gases and overpowering gravity. Not only is it pretty cold out at Jupiter, uh, it's also, you know, it's got this really thick atmosphere, tens of thousands of miles thick, and it's got ammonia and methane and, you know, things used to clean the bathroom. But Jupiter has more than 60 moons that we know about. At first glance, those moons would seem unlikely places to seek alien life. 
Their atmospheres are thin and they are inhumanly cold. The temperature on Callisto is lower than minus 200 degrees Celsius. The scientific probes Voyager and Galileo have detected little on the surface of these moons but ice, with one dramatic exception. Io is one of the closest moons to Jupiter. When NASA sent Voyager 1 to Io in 1979, astronomers were astonished to find its surface roiling with giant volcanoes. Io is the most volcanically active place in the solar system, just spewing volcanic material from its surface all the time. What could be heating the interior of this frigid moon? Amazingly, it's the force of gravity from Jupiter. The giant planet exerts enormous gravitational pull on its moons. The closer the moon, the stronger the force. So strong, it can actually stretch their crusts. But some of these moons have elliptical orbits, so as they near Jupiter, the crust stretches towards it. When they move further away, the crust relaxes back towards spherical. This constant tidal movement creates friction deep inside, and that friction generates heat. It's like rubbing two sticks together to start a fire. The pull of Jupiter is heating Io from the inside out. Volcanic fumes and lack of water make Io inhospitable to life. But Jupiter's other large moons are more distant, close enough for Jupiter's gravity to warm them from within, but distant enough to remain calm on the surface. Three of them look particularly promising as possible homes for alien life. The one furthest from the giant planet, Callisto. On its surface, Callisto looks like our moon, scarred and cratered by countless hits from asteroids. Those impacts may have melted the surface ice for brief periods, allowing life to take hold. But in 1998, the Galileo spacecraft detected a much more promising incubator deep beneath Callisto's surface. Radioactive rocks and tremendous pressure in its core generate heat inside Callisto. The heat may be melting its icy crust from below, creating a hidden ocean. And hidden oceans could mean hidden life. As we fly closer to Jupiter, we find its largest moon, Ganymede. Ganymede is also deeply scarred. Ridges rise above its surface. Those bright spots are craters as big as five kilometers across and likely to be lined with frost. But these photos offer the most compelling clues to where life here might hide. They show flowing glaciers glaciers that resemble those on Earth. Ganymede's moving glaciers could also be signs of heat within. So, like Callisto, Ganymede could also have a hidden ocean, buried beneath as much as 190 kilometers of ice. The third moon on this leg of our alien safari is the most intriguing. It is called Europa, and of the three, it resides closest to Jupiter. That proximity to the giant planet means Europa's core may be very hot, far hotter than Callisto's or Ganymede's. But its surface remains frigid, a potent combination for life, since there could be a temperate zone where they meet. Mammoth fissures scar Europa's thick crust of ice, a sign that ice is always shifting. On our own planet, we see the same cracks in the ice sheets covering the Arctic Ocean. Europa's crust may be riding the largest ocean in the solar system, an ocean twice as large as all of Earth's put together. 
Now, those oceans, if they're there, and the chances are pretty good that at least some of them are, uh, they've been sitting around for a long time, four billion years, a little longer, right? In four billion years, an ocean of water, do you think anything might have cooked up there? Well, it certainly seems plausible. The environment on, in Europa's ocean is, is more or less as nice as the environment in our own ocean, as a place for, for living things to exist. Heck, things from planet Earth could probably live in the European Ocean. But Europa's oceans would be very cold, even slushy. And sunlight never penetrates them, thanks to an icy cover that may be 16 kilometers thick. We might never have thought life could exist here if not for a revolutionary discovery off the coast of Ecuador. Deep in the Pacific, biologists have found flourishing communities of tube worms, crabs, and even squid. These creatures are thriving despite complete darkness, extreme cold, and the pressure of the deep ocean. They feed on bacteria that take their energy not from the sun, but from chemicals erupting from the sea floor. We might find very similar volcanic vents on Europa, supporting their own web of life. To find out, NASA scientists would like to put a lander on the European surface. Some would like to send a cryobot, a robot that would melt the ice and release a probe into the liquid below. That's not so hard to do, you just have to melt your way through. But you're going to have to melt your way through not a couple hundred feet, but a, maybe a, a dozen miles of ice. And send down a, a, a fishing line with a, a, maybe a video camera and a light bulb on it and look around. In all that water, we can't rule out the possibility that very simple life forms have evolved further. We might even find creatures as advanced as some here at home. Most likely, however, we would find microbes. But even that would be a sea change in how we view the birth and growth of life. Europa was warm. What if the place is one of the coldest known? Or if its lakes flow with toxic chemicals instead of water? These are the worlds we find as our safari continues even deeper into space. As our safari in search of alien life sweeps by the ringed planet, Saturn, we can see the violently swirling gases that choke its atmosphere. We can also feel Saturn's gravity, weaker than Jupiter's, but still formidable. We'll keep moving. We're not likely to find living things here. Saturn's rings are also extremely inhospitable. They're made of rock and ice, as small as a grain of sugar or as big as a house. But Saturn has many moons, 56 that we've spotted so far. Our safari heads first to one of those moons, a tiny frigid satellite called Enceladus, just 500 kilometers in diameter. Here, gravity is very weak, a fraction of that on Earth. And Enceladus has hardly any atmosphere. It reflects back into space almost all the sunlight that hits it, making it the shiniest object in our solar system. Until very recently, we also thought Enceladus was too cold to support life. It appears we were wrong. In 2005, after a seven-year journey, the Cassini spacecraft approached the tiny moon and detected something that stunned the mission's principal investigator, Caroline Porco. So th this was the picture that just, you know, grabbed us. Just was shocking. Those are plumes made of water from a geyser. The geyser's steam and hot water hit the cold vacuum of space and explode into a jet of ice. With little gravity to rein it in, the ice cloud can grow as big as Enceladus itself. Porco has never seen anything like it anywhere else. It's like a planetary explorer's dream 
to come upon a body like Enceladus. Those jets, those fountains, if you will, just spewing vapor and icy snow hundreds of kilometers above the south pole of Enceladus. There's only one conclusion. Tiny, frigid Enceladus is piping hot within. Like Jupiter, Saturn's giant gravitational field tugs on its satellites, creating friction and heat within. As far as we can tell now, it seems like an inescapable conclusion that there may be liquid water deeper down on Enceladus because it's warm. And the best models we can put forth right now to even explain the warmth, much less the jets, seem to indicate that you would get temperatures warm enough to melt water. Heat, liquid water, even the furthest reaches of our solar system may contain the chemistry for life. What kind of creature could live in the steamy waters of a geyser? Thanks to hot springs back on Earth, we have some idea. At one point, we assumed nothing lived in the steam-driven fountains of Yellowstone National Park. But then, biologists discovered microbes in these waters. Microbes that feed on chemicals dissolved in the water. Today, we call them thermophiles. The hardiest can thrive in boiling water. Could there be thermophiles on Enceladus? To find out, our safari takes us in for a close-up of this extraterrestrial old faithful. It's too cold for anything to live near the surface, but temperatures there are minus 165 degrees Celsius. But what about the hot water inside? In the ice plume above Enceladus, Cassini's probes have found carbon dioxide and methane, chemicals that could feed life below. Just as the chemical-laden springs of Yellowstone feed microbes living there. We have a body that um, very, very likely has liquid water in its interior, has shown us already it's got simple organic compounds, and, um, you know, a whole host of things that make it, I think, a major body of astrobiological interest in our solar system. If Enceladus has been a shock, astronomers have been astounded by another of Saturn's moons, Titan. It may be the unlikeliest to harbor life. Titan gets only a limited amount of sunlight, about a thousandth as much as Earth. Probes sent to Titan have detected ice, but no liquid water. And at temperatures of minus 138 degrees Celsius, that ice is hard as stone. What could possibly make Titan a promising environment for alien life? Remarkably, Titan in many ways resembles the Earth, but not the one we know now. Titan has turned out to be the body fantastic in the Saturn system, which is long suspected of having an environment at the surface, not only similar to the kind of environment we find here on Earth, even, believe it or not, similar to the kind of environment we had on Earth before the emergence of life. Titan intrigued Carolyn and Porco's team so much, they directed the Cassini spacecraft to send a probe there in 2005. It was the most distant surface mission ever conducted. The probe saw just ridges and plains. But a later flyover by Cassini spotted a shoreline. Soon, thousands of lakes came into view, at least one bigger than the Great Lakes of North America. It's the first time we've ever detected liquid on the surface of another celestial body. Kind of looks like Minnesota, except the lakes are not water. They're, they're liquid natural gas. But liquid natural gas is a liquid. And that's not snow. Those are methane flakes. Like Earth, Titan has weather. But it's of a rather psychedelic kind. There are even methane hurricanes. 
it's not water, it's methane doing all the exact same things, raining, evaporating, flowing in rivers. So you have something that, that is basically doing what water does on Earth on Titan, only it's methane. A similar scene may have existed on Earth four billion years ago, making scientists suspect that Titan could also be an incubator for life. Chemistry does go on. At those cold temperatures, it's really slow. But Titan has had four billion years in which to do some chemistry, and maybe in that period of time, maybe something is cooked up. It would have to cook up without liquid water, something we've never seen before. But scientists aren't ruling it out. The substitute could be the methane, so abundant on Titan. Used for fuel on Earth, methane was long thought poisonous to all life. But in 1997, researchers examined mounds of methane ice in the Gulf of Mexico, and they were astonished to find colonies of small centipede-like worms thriving amid the frozen substance. They think the worms may eat bacteria that feed on the methane. In general, um, things that we think of as deadly, many of them are potentially lively. If you can figure out an evolutionary way to tap into that energy rather than having it destroy you, then it, it can be bountiful. There could be one more complication for life on the surface of Titan. With only a weak magnetic field to shield it, living things on the surface could be exposed to cosmic radiation. But that might not be a problem for an extremophile, as we found here on Earth. Biologists have uncovered plenty of life near Chernobyl's contaminated nuclear reactor. And even swimming in toxic radioactive spills, actually feeding off the decaying molecules. It's possible Titan's life forms could do the same. To find life on Titan, we may have to dive into its methane lakes, where we might find chemical-loving bacteria. We may even find microbes resistant to radiation, not unlike those here on Earth at Chernobyl, living on its rock-hard ice sheets. Organisms that eat methane might give off heat, melting the ice, possibly creating another fountain for life. There's no doubt, life on Titan would be a strange brew. But we have yet to visit the most bizarre world where scientists believe life could exist. And it's much closer to home. Our safari of the world's most likely to harbor alien life has taken us far. We've visited frigid deserts, submerged oceans, and methane lakes. But the world we are about to visit may be the most extreme of all. For our final stop, we are turning back toward Earth, to Venus, our closest planetary neighbor in the solar system. If life can survive here, it seems it could exist almost everywhere. To reach the surface of Venus, we have to fly through a dense layer of yellow clouds, 64 kilometers deep, with a composition similar to battery acid. The atmosphere here is 90 times heavier than Earth's, too heavy for a human to tolerate. On the ground, there are extinct volcanoes and lava flows as far as the eye can see. They cover 85% of the planet's surface. It is hard to believe Venus once had vast oceans. You basically had a runaway greenhouse effect where uh, as it starts to get warmer, the oceans start to evaporate, and then that puts water vapor in the air. Well, water vapor is a potent greenhouse gas, so that's what leads to the runaway. The oceans basically boil off, and then the CO2 all ends up in the atmosphere, and so today you have this very hot, hyper greenhouse planet. With temperatures around 460 degrees Celsius, Venus is even hotter than Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. Not a surface hospitable to life. Life as we know it cannot exist on the surface of Venus because organic molecules would just be ripped to shreds by, by the hot gases. 
But we've stopped here, not because of what's on the ground, but what's in the air. In 1982, the Soviet spacecraft Venera 14 visited Venus. In the clouds, 50 kilometers up, it detected temperatures much cooler than on the surface. What's more, it found the molecules so critical for life, H2O. So far, every bit of water we've found beyond Earth is frozen solid. Only in the clouds above Venus have we found it in vapor form, a possible incubator for life. But Venus's clouds are also filled with highly acidic sulfur. Once, we thought nothing could live in sulfur. But scientists have analyzed some of the most acidic water on Earth, leaching from a California mine. Watch your hand, in sulfuric acids strong enough to erode metal, eat through clothing and dissolve human flesh, they found life. Acid-loving extremophiles. These organisms feed on sulfur compounds, like iron sulfide, eating the iron and emitting the highly acidic sulfur. Do extremophiles like these float above Venus? Astrobiologist David Grinspoon likes to think it's possible. Maybe in the clouds of Venus there are some sulfur-based organisms. Sulfur actually absorbs ultraviolet light in interesting ways, and I'm just imagining that there's some, maybe some kind of photochemical um, reaction going on where uh, ultraviolet light is actually being used to convert chemicals into some higher energy state, which then is, is basically being eaten. What will these aliens be like if we do find them? They would have to tolerate high temperatures and enormous atmospheric pressure. They would also need to thrive in acid concentrations deadly to most life forms. Perhaps they might resemble a hardier version of the acid resistant extremophiles in California's mine. We keep finding that life lives in places that we used to think were inhospitable. So whenever we say, oh, it's impossible, you couldn't have life in the clouds of Venus, I think we have to be very careful because they might just reflect our own ignorance or our uh, limitations on our own imagination and maybe not real limitations on the, the ultimate creativity of nature, which seems to find solutions to these problems. As our safari returns to the cool, blue, lush and lively world of Earth, we can see why we so revere its life-sustaining gifts. But, as we are learning, even the most extreme environments can harbor living things. Extremophiles may resemble the first version of life in our universe, and they could even be the most common. Could they have evolved further from these humble beginnings? Could intelligent life be out there as well? For more than 40 years, scientists at the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute in California have been searching the skies for answers to that question. Astronomer Seth Shostak believes he'll know the sound of alien life when he hears it. We have a couple of, of observing projects to try and find signals. The biggest one are our radio searches, and that's where we use big arrays of antennas, and we point these antennas at nearby star systems that we think, well, this is the kind of star that might have a planet that might be something like Earth. We point in those directions, hoping to pick up a signal that would tell us that somebody there is clever enough to build a radio transmitter. It's a safari that never leaves home. Today, we're closer than ever to knowing the answer. Some scientists believe we'll get our first look at our extraterrestrial cousins in the near future. I hope it's in the next 10 years, and I'm ready for it next week. So, <laughs> the sooner the better. What's more, we could find these aliens not on distant planets in unexplored galaxies, but right next door in our own solar system. Scientists are now honing in on proof that E.T. is out there and living on the most hazardous of worlds. 
Our safari will journey to seven destinations in our solar system to see just where these creatures could be and what they might look like. These exotic lands are unimaginably harsh. Life as we think of it would perish in an instant. But alien life may be far tougher than we expect, as we're learning from a surprising group of living things right here on Earth. Until just a few decades ago, we were sure our planet was unique. It is the only one we've found so far that has nurtured the evolution of millions of species. Thanks to its abundant sunshine, warm water, and protective atmosphere. We logically concluded that life needed each of those things, a conclusion that ruled out all other known worlds in our solar system. But then, biologists began combing some of the Earth's darkest and coldest places. And to their surprise, they found living, breathing creatures. Biologists call these organisms extremophiles. Some don't need light or oxygen. Others survive in tremendous atmospheric pressure. It seems life can turn up practically anywhere. Take Antarctica. After years of searching this arid, frozen landscape, scientists doubted they'd find anything alive. But in 1999, a team of explorers unearthed a rock from six feet under the ice. What they found amazed them. When they cracked the rock open, they found it teeming with tiny creatures. Here, at temperatures of 68 degrees below zero and six feet under solid ice, life had found a foothold. Biologists have been increasingly discovering life, not kangaroos, but, you know, simpler forms of life that live at very cold temperatures, very high temperatures, very great pressures, even in places where there's sort of a high degree of radiation. It turns out life is able to live in a much wider variety of environments on our own planet than we used to think. And if life can survive extreme conditions, not just here at home, but elsewhere in our solar system, think of what this could mean. How could it survive in such extreme conditions? Since the 1960s, scientists have sent dozens of probes to the red planet. The first pictures of the barren landscape quickly dashed any hope of finding intelligent beings. But what scientists did see startled them. Though there's no evidence of Martian-made canals, there are signs that Mars actually may have had water. Some think the angry red planet might once have been blue. You just have to look back a couple of billion years, three and a half billion, four billion years ago, Mars had a thicker atmosphere, had water on its surface clearly, maybe it developed life. And as it slowly went bad, you know, the life had to adapt. Life may have adapted, not died off, because some liquid water may still exist underground. But with no surface water, frigid temperatures, and ultra-thin atmosphere, Mars is a planet only one kind of creature could love, an extremophile. Extremophiles thrive in the cruelest of places. To see where they might lurk on Mars, we head to the Valles Marineris, a massive rift in Mars's surface, 20 times wider than the Grand Canyon in places, and almost as deep as Mount Everest is tall. Lakes may have once flooded this valley, and those lakes could have hosted life. As the water dried up, life could have evolved to cope with the harsher environment. We won't know what these extremophiles are like until we find them.
but they may resemble creatures that exist in extreme places right here on Earth. An unusual team of biologists, called astrobiologists, study Earth for the kinds of life we may find in outer space. Astrobiologist Rocco Mancinelli is on the hunt for Mars's extremophiles. If it went beneath the surface, and some of it undoubtedly did, then what happened to it? Well, it formed brine pockets. So what kind of organism can live in a salty brine? A salt-loving organism. Astrobiologist Chris McKay thinks he knows the kind of salt-loving creatures that might survive on Mars. Creatures much like those he's found in one of the driest, saltiest places on Earth. The fundamental challenge to life on Mars is, in a sense, the fundamental challenge of life here in Death Valley, its dryness. That is the hardest thing for life to adapt to. Thousands of years ago, a salty lake covered Death Valley, just as lakes filled Mars's Mariner Trench. Move in closer. This is still wet, a little wet. This appears like a lifeless place, a big, flat, white, empty horizon. But yet, just below the surface, we find layers of algae and bacteria growing. They're living in a, an environment that in many ways is fundamentally different from the environment that we sense on the surface. The system near an asteroid belt. Its atmosphere is too flimsy to protect it. Asteroids continually bombard its surface. Violent winds can whip Mars's sandy soil into storms that consume the entire planet for weeks and spawn tornadoes eight kilometers high. Midday temperatures at the equator of one degree Celsius fall to minus 70 at night. David Grinspoon is a curator of astrobiology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. As he sees it, Mars would be warmer if it wasn't a planetary runt. When I grab coffee on a cold morning, I know that a small espresso is going to cool off quickly, whereas a larger coffee is going to stay warm much longer. Large objects stay warm longer because their interiors are shielded from the outside where the cooling occurs. And planets are exactly the same way. A small planet will cool off early in its history. A larger planet like Earth will stay warm for billions of years, which makes it a better place probably to look for life. Despite Mars's drawbacks, it has always fascinated scientists because its terrain seemed to give evidence that it might support life. Its dynamic landscape of mountains, volcanoes and deep ravines is not unlike our Earth. To early astronomers, these features look like oceans and rivers and even a system of canals, supposedly not just supporting life, but actually produced by it. Percival Lowell in the United States uh, observed these things and inferred that, in fact, these were, things were so straight and so regular in geometry that they had to have been the product of intelligent life. Okay? Well, he was right. The problem was the life was at the wrong end of the telescope. In viewing this thing visually through a telescope eyepiece, the, the human eye-brain combination started to connect things that weren't really there. Lowell was not alone. Some scientists were shocked when the probe Viking 1 beamed back this image. Is that a human face? Perhaps produced by Martians in their own likeness? Until recently, we've never really known where to look in our solar system for extraterrestrial life. But we've always known what the aliens would be like once we found them. Consciousness. I was on a table. Usually, there is more than a hint of the Earthling in our aliens. Hostile or lovable, they tend to resemble mutant images of ourselves. As a senior astronomer at the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute in California, Seth Shostak has spent his career listening for the radio waves of a distant alien society. 
there's no reason to assume that they're going to look like us or even think like us or behave like us or have language. You know, you just have to look at the variety of life on Earth and you see that, you know, nature can come up with lots of different forms. But if there is life on Mars... Here you're in a place which looks lifeless, looks dead, and yet you dig down and hidden underneath, there it is. Beneath the salt is a layer of hardy green algae that survive on the water and light that trickle through. The algae in turn feed salt-loving microorganisms. Here in deserts on Earth, dried, salty lake beds, we're going to find them on Mars as well. Salty deserts are not the only places life might be hiding on the red planet. There are Mars's tremendous volcanoes, some of them six times larger than those on Earth. Astrobiologist Penny Boston studies the caves, called lava tubes, left over after volcanic lava has dissipated. Not long ago, we assumed caves like these were devoid of life. They get no sunlight, and no sunlight means no photosynthesis. But in lava tubes outside Albuquerque, New Mexico, Boston has found evidence of extreme life. Because we know Mars has many, many lava tubes. And so here we have the opportunity to see how these formed and also to look at the life that inhabits them. The extremophiles Boston has found appear to be thriving. They get their energy by feeding on the minerals in the cave wall. So here we're up close to the wall and you can see these white patches here growing against the black basalt. And each one of these is like a major city for these little guys. And they're, you know, they're all nestled in these little pockets in the basalt. And so these guys are permanently adapted to these freezing temperatures. Uh, they never see any light and they get uh, what they can find in the environment. Are there creatures like these in the caves below Mars's volcano fields? Boston thinks so. We are going to find life, and I just hope that I live a long and healthy life so that I can still be around to see that. We may already have had our first glimpse of Martians, not from our visit to their planet, but from their visit to ours. 16 million years ago, an asteroid slammed into Mars and propelled a two kilogram rock into space. Amazingly, that rock sailed to Earth and came to rest in Antarctica. Inside, NASA scientist David McKay and Everett Gibson were amazed to spot the outlines of fossils. Water has carved small tunnels in the rock. And in these tunnels, McKay and Gibson found what they believe to be evidence of bacterial life. These are little microbes, and they're dead, and they're, they're fossils, or in some cases, we don't even see the forms. We see the footprints or the evidence that they were there. Life from Mars? Maybe. The hunt is only just beginning. NASA plans to send a rover called Phoenix to Mars. Unless there's something extraordinarily miraculous about our solar system or our planet, then life has got to be extremely commonplace. I mean, there's got to be large numbers of worlds with life. And some of them would have cooked up intelligent life. In the beginning, our Earth was as deadly a planet as any. Over the first billion years of Earth's existence, cosmic debris pummeled it mercilessly. The impacts turned its surface into a broiling, seething inferno where life was impossible. But once the solar system settled down and the Earth began to cool, water appeared, setting the stage for life. In 1953, Researcher Stanley Miller proved in a lab experiment just how easily life on Earth got its start. 
He combined water with hydrogen, methane, and ammonia, components of the Earth's early atmosphere. Then he zapped his solution with an electric charge to simulate lightning. His results shocked the world. Miller had created organic molecules called amino acids, the protein building blocks of all living things. If lightning helped jumpstart life on Earth, could it have done the same on other planets? Galactic probes have now found the ingredients in Miller's experiment throughout our solar system, including one essential to life. One of the requirements that every form of life that we know about on Earth has, every single one, is liquid water. We've used evidence for liquid water to kind of guide our search for habitable environments. Our safari is headed to seven worlds, some possibly rich in water, where scientists believe aliens might be hiding. While any life there might have begun much like life on Earth, how it looks now is anyone's guess. We begin in the world that has always fired our imaginations, the planet right next door, Mars. Of all the planets where we've looked for life, it's the one we've studied most. The scientist who may get the first look at Martians, if they're found, is Steve Squires, principal investigator for NASA's Mars rovers. Mars has always had, among all the planets, I think a special fascination for, for humans. For a very long time, we've known enough about Mars to know that it is probably the most Earth-like. It may be the most like Earth, with an atmosphere and seasons, but we humans would perish quickly on Mars. Its air is thin, 40 times thinner than the air at the top of Mount Everest. And it sits in a bad neighborhood of our minority of the population. For example, if you show people a photograph which is actually being computer generated of them from their childhood, uh, going on a balloon ride. And this photograph is in with lots of photographs from things in their childhood which really did take place. A sizable minority will actually quite happily tell you about the time they went up in a hot air balloon when they were six, even though that event never actually took place. We do know that we're all potentially prone to these false memories, much more so than we would ever have once guessed. False memory syndrome is based on the idea that memory is faulty. And memory is faulty. Obviously, I'm living proof that memory is faulty the older I get. The fact is, though, that memory is not so faulty that people are going to forget entire events. They might get details wrong. They might get their chronology out of order a little bit. But the fact that they were, for example, in a train crash or, or something like that, they're not going to forget that event. Without anecdotal evidence, without human memory, Without the ability to retrieve memories, we would not have a judicial system and a civilization would grind to a halt. Psychologists have developed a wide range of plausible theories to explain why individuals believe they've been abducted by aliens. But all of them have ultimately been countered by ufologists. It has ranged from simply lying to psychosis, it's mass hallucination, it's mass hysteria. It goes on and on and on. There is no end to it. However, skeptics believe there is one simple factor that makes their case watertight. As a scientist, I'm interested in the question of whether or not there is anything happening here in terms of objective reality. If there's no way of us being able to produce any kind of evidence, hard physical evidence, then I'd say that what we're looking at is essentially a psychological phenomenon. In order to really challenge the skeptics' argument, Ufologists need to find evidence that can stand up to scientific scrutiny. In France, one of the real 4400 believe they may hold the proof ufologists have been looking for. Je le considère absolument rationnel à la fois dans les activités et dans les pensées que que j'ai. 
Eric Julien is a retired pilot and air traffic controller whose career involved making tough decisions while under immense pressure. Pour exercer le métier qui demande une stabilité psychologique extrêmement importante, tant pour être pilote que pour être contrôleur aérien. Over the past 15 years, Eric claims to have had a variety of extraterrestrial experiences, both at home and at work. C'est également le contact radar d'un target sur mon scope radar lorsque j'étais contrôleur aérien dans l'armée de l'air qui allait de l'est vers l'ouest à 28 000 km h As well as sightings, Eric claims to have had regular contact and communication with alien beings that have given him a clear understanding of their technology. C'est que nos outils scientifiques de preuve sont limités à l'espace matériel de la réalité. Et c'est toute la difficulté que nous avons à comprendre le comportement des extraterrestres précisément. After enduring years of abduction experiences, Eric believes he has recently been left with solid evidence of their visits. Un élément de preuve qui peut être apporté donc à la science, c'est l'apparition soudaine en l'espace. You see it? Pourrait être un implant qui a été posé par des extraterrestres au cours d'une nuit. Eric's lump provides science with something tangible it can test. But Bud Hopkins believes his 30 years of research has already unearthed all the evidence that anyone would need. The skeptics are fond of saying there's no physical evidence. Um, what the skeptics are saying, gee, I haven't heard of any because I haven't looked into it. Okay, these are some of the photographs of, of scoop marks that turn up again and again. I may have seen a hundred of these. Why don't the critics uh, recognize it? It's because they don't even know anything about it. But Bud has collected has photographs of abductees who claim their experience left them with abnormal scars. This is on a man's back. Here's another one on the front of the shin. This is one on a little boy that turned up overnight. He was five years old. I had one case where there were three young women involved in an abduction experience. Uh, and uh, at the end of it, each one had a scoop mark in exactly the same place. The doctors who have looked at these things uh, have told me that they most closely resemble uh, the scars from punch biopsies. Sometimes they will take two samples. A person is re-abducted and another sample is taken. Sometimes people remember the tool that was used. One can infer without <laughs> much difficulty that they are taking a flesh sample to take from us um, our own DNA, our own physical genetic makeup. Again, these are marks which turn up again and again, but we have no explanation of exactly why they are taking this flesh, except obviously they're getting some kind of sample. Then to visit a leading ear, nose and throat specialist and have the lump behind his ear tested. Hello. Hello, this is Eric Julien to see Dr. Patel, please. Come on in. He's hoping the results will make sense of his belief that the lump is in fact an alien implant. C'est peut-être une découverte euh, étonnante et, et qui pourra intéresser beaucoup de gens. Glad to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay, let's take a look at this lump. And it's not tender at all if I was to touch it like this, not causing any pain or discomfort. No. Et que ce qui est le plus étrange dans, dans cet euh, implant, c'est qu'il bouge tout seul. Il a bougé de 12 mm en 6 mois. Just turn your head slightly away from me. Et je ne connais pas de corps euh, organique au, dans le corps humain qui puisse euh, faire ce, ce type d'exploit. De, this could be easy to diagnose further by doing a couple of tests. Mm -hmm. And I propose that we do an ultrasound of this area and a plain x-ray. Mm -hmm. And that should give us a lot more information. One of the reasons why Eric believes his lump is an implant is due to the nature of his experiences that took place in the summer of 2003. Hello, Mr. Julian. Alice McLean, I'm the radiologist. Parmi les expériences que j'ai connues, il y avait des expériences médicales. You've got a, a lump or a problem behind your ear, I understand. Yes, okay. right here. J'étais donc souvent allongé sur euh, une espèce de lit dans une salle qui ressemblait à celle d'un dentiste et j'ai plusieurs fois connu des expériences de, de sondes au-dessus du crâne et dessus euh, sur le front. All right, that's probably all we need. Once the ultrasound and x-ray results are processed and evaluated, Eric Julian, post auricular ulcer. The consultant will be able to provide Eric with a clear diagnosis of his lump.
experience. Rachel, Anne and the boys were left confused by what it was they experienced. The next day we talked about it again and you just wanted to know who else had seen it. But you just didn't know how, how to, to find that out and you know we talked about a number of things and mum came up with the idea of phoning the radio station, radio. the local radio station. A family from North Lancashire have been describing how they saw a mysterious light in the sky last night. Rachel Devereux was driving on the moors between Ingleton and Bentham with her two children and her mother, Anne. They all saw a bright light move at great speed and change directions. Anne says she's never seen anything like it before. This was like a really, really bright, pure white light in a perfect ball shape. No trails, nothing. Lots of people say, well, a few people have said they see this light seriously. Keith near Clitheroe, Vera in Clitheroe, and Ian in Feniscoles. A local UFO group also heard the family's story and made contact. I got in touch with Anne first. I phoned her up, and that was shortly after they first saw the light. And she was very euphoric about it. She was just wanting to know what it was, really. The UFO group were able to help Rachel and Anne document the events of the night but the emotional support they could offer was limited. We're a local UFO group. We're not professionally qualified at all. And I think it would be quite difficult for someone to go to their MP, who, I mean, the GP. There isn't anyone who can t deal with people who've got a strange experience like this. I think they'll want to get answers to what happened to them during that time. Whether they will do is open to question. You suddenly, you've got all these different factors in your life that are just a complete mystery. It's helplessness. And it makes you cry. Because you don't know how to stop it. You don't know what it was. Um, I mean, it's making me cry now. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> if you start to think about it like we are now, mm. it becomes overwhelming mm. and you can't cope with it. I mean, they can mock you, the skeptics can say, oh, you've all got false memories and you all imagined it. But I know I didn't, because I know how it's made me feel inside. More than anything, it's, um, it's just wanting to make sense of it. That's the way, that's the feeling it gives you. Just wanting more knowledge and wanting to, to make everything fit into place in a way that you can understand. While these experiences often create feelings of fear and anxiety, not everyone who reports them find them distressing. In fact, many believe their contact with extraterrestrial beings has ultimately enriched their lives. My first really um, conscious memory of my experiences with extraterrestrials was from about the age of three years old, where I would be meeting, I guess, like my other family. They were no different to me. I just saw them as my, my star family, like, you know, and my parents here were my Earth family. Tracy Taylor grew up in Perth, Western Australia, and claims to have had regular experiences that involved tests on her body and information put into her mind. I think I learned pretty quick not to talk about it. Um, I think I just focused it into my schoolwork and used the knowledge and the understandings that I had to, to do well. He now wants to develop into a career. The first time I ever did one of these drawings, I just had the urge to get my paper and my pen. Something just sort of came over me and my hand started to move. Do you actually see anything or is it just from within you? Like a, a downloading of information, I suppose, in a symbolic form. It just sort of seems to feel like it comes through me, it's not from me. Much more like a sort of radio wave. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's... Tracy was interested in art before these illustrations came through, but claims that her style of drawing changed radically overnight. I mean, this I recognise very much a sort of Aztec type of symbol. 
over a period of time, I spoke to people who study ancient cultures and these people were able to pinpoint things in the pictures saying this is something that you could find in a temple in, in Peru and this is something you'd find in a temple in, in Luxor in Egypt. And can an expert read this? I've had linguists uh, looking at it and they say again that it's related to hieroglyphics in ancient Sumerian. At various times over the past six years, Tracy has also produced a series of graphical illustrations, which she claims she later discovered hold a hidden message. And that circle's dropping over the top of that pyramid. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And yet again it fits. So these are all done over different periods of time and yet they all lock together yes. to form a whole. Looking at just on a purely surface level, there is an element of storytelling. Apparently this depicts the past and moving into the present and then yeah. moving into the future. The and that element of storytelling I can relate to because they have a similarity to stained glass windows and telling a spiritual story. And the lotus blossoms. And that bursting forth, yeah. We probably may we never know the answer of where it comes from or how it gets to be in a pencil at the tip of her hand. But you can't take away from the fact that there is something there. It's common for abductees to claim to be given special abilities as a result of their experience. Typically, these will include the ability to heal or to be able to pass on messages to humanity. If in some way the messages that are coming through me can assist other people and the planet that they're connected to, I think it's, it's great. One of the things that has to always be borne in mind about the abduction experience is that the communication in virtually all these cases is telepathic. So one has to assume that every abductee can pick up thoughts from the aliens and, and communicate uh, non-verbally. Therefore, that's a basic a paranormal gift. Is that something that only abductees have or is that something that might be more extensively present in the population? We don't really know. Believers argue that people who return with enhanced psychic abilities provide yet further proof that their experience was real. People who've had this experience claim that they have unusual powers. But in actual fact, they don't seem able to demonstrate these powers under controlled conditions. If they could, then that would be absolutely amazing. But at the moment, the, the wider scientific community doesn't even accept that these kind of claim powers are real. Yeah. Skeptics continue to dismiss the types of evidence ufologists and believers have to offer. But can they ignore the medical opinion of a qualified surgeon? Especially one who claims that strange objects he has removed from abductees defy earthly explanation. We have those which are metallic and covered with this very, very strange membrane. And at the time of surgery, it can't be cut with a surgical blade. It's impervious to cutting. Rachel Devereaux had her first missing time experience just three months ago while driving home. Having looked into the phenomenon, she has decided to take a bold but common step for people who have had this type of encounter. Hi. Hi. She's going to have hypnotic regression. I'm feeling quite nervous about it, about the uh, regression, um, but also quite excited. Right, so you might not have done this before, but I've done it a few thousand times. Rachel's hoping that under hypnosis she can be taken back to when she had her experience and retrieve memories that are not consciously accessible. I want it to be an honest account, you know, if I do remember. How do you feel? Happy. It's no walls, it's just black everywhere. It's like standing in the middle of space. There's big, big bright light here, right in front of me. That's high, and that's watching what the little ones are doing, the small ones going around and looking at us and talking to each other. They think the boys are funny. They think they're funny. I can hear laughing now, the children laughing, they're really giggling. <laughs> I'm scared for the children. 
put the lights there and it's just telling me it's fine and we're not going to hurt them. They're your children. They're your children, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Just feel yourself coming back more and more alert. Good, well done. How do you feel? Wow. <laughs> I can't believe how real that felt. From my perspective, having completed thousands of regressions over the years. She didn't fabricate that. She no. didn't pretend uh, to cry. Speechless. <laughs> I'm just kind of speechless. Do I believe everything that happened? I'm sort of 90% there, yeah. But it was real. Testimonies obtained from abductees under hypnosis often provide compelling, detailed accounts of what happened during their missing time episode. They have given ufologists a mountain of anecdotal evidence to support their claims. But skeptics find these reports unreliable. The alien abduction phenomenon, I, I think, is somewhat complicated by the whole debate about hypnosis. Let's be honest, scientists don't even agree on what hypnosis is. People typically think that hypnotic regression is this kind of magic key for unlocking repressed or hidden memories. In actual fact, it's a great way of producing false memories. It's based on expectations, it's based on imagination, it's all we woven together and then they believe in this narrative. In the hands of the wrong people, it can be disastrous. Uh, and uh, in the hands of the right people, people who know what they're doing, who have adequate controls in place for false memories and things like that, hypnosis is an excellent tool for getting at the truth. With such a major source of research ignored by skeptics, the need for unequivocal physical evidence is all the more important. In America, a surgeon has come forward with claims which may provide ufologists with the break they've been hoping for. I started this as the ultimate uh, skeptic. I was uh, then uh, embroiled in the phenomena and shown things that could not be satisfactorily explained by our own science. Dr. Lear has been a practicing foot surgeon for the past 35 years. But in 1994, he began removing foreign bodies from patients who claimed they were alien implants. I'm going to numb you up right now. Is that all right? Okay, that's fine. So we're going to numb the area up real good. A lot of these people have uh, uh, things in their bodies which they've stepped on or they're exposed in a machine shop to a piece of metal. I'll make a small incision right here, not a big one. Uh, others, uh, unfortunately, have mental problems and uh, would like to be an abductee. Since he started in this area eight years ago, Dr. Lear has conducted 11 operations and claims to have removed an assortment of mysterious objects. Looks like it to me. Looks black. Yeah. Here it is, here. So let's put a piece of white gauze. I think this is it, so we're going to x-ray to make sure. Uh, we have those which are metallic and covered with this very, very strange membrane. And at the time of surgery, it can't be cut with a surgical blade. It's impervious to cutting. And researching the pathology books, no such entity has ever been found in the human body. A logic explanation would be that it's not human tissue, of course. However, when we get into the metals, that's when we really get into the strange stuff. We had help from the National Institute for Discovery Science, and they sent the first set of specimens to Los Alamos National Labs and to Mexico, New Mexico Tech. Now, these were blind studies. All the studies are blind, and I mean by that that the laboratories are not told the origin of the specimens. And the best analogy that the scientists were able to make initially were these were very close to meteorites. The scientific community has generally disregarded Dr. Lear's claims. They feel his studies are inconclusive and are not supervised closely enough to rule out any chance that his samples may have been tampered with. Uh, metallic uh, object in this uh, container is uh, being sealed. Dr. Lear stands by his claims and thinks it is the skeptics who are at fault. I have never met a skeptic yet that didn't know everything about what I was doing and drawn all the conclusion, but has never looked at one shred of the physical evidence or the data.
the moment of truth has arrived for Eric. With the X-ray and ultrasound results returned to the consultant, Eric is about to discover if the lump behind his ear is natural or extraterrestrial. Il faudra que ce corps médical puisse aussi expliquer comment une telle protubérance peut bouger de 12 mm en 6 mois. The first thing I want to show you is the ultrasound report and the ultrasound scan. And as you can see here, there is the lesion that we are looking at and it's just under the surface of the skin. And the appearances are those in keeping with a cyst and nothing else. And when we look at the plain X-ray, there certainly is nothing metallic uh, or anything of a hard consistency mm -hmm. uh, in this lump. And uh, uh, this is again in keeping with the diagnosis of a benign cystic lesion. We call it a sebaceous cyst. It's a collection of um, material from a blocked sweat gland and it arises when a sweat pore becomes obstructed and the normal sebaceous material is not able to escape and therefore collects under the skin surface and forms a cystic collection. Could it be possible to have an explanation about how uh, a cyst could move from one way to from one point to another one? There is no easy solution or answer to that problem. I am, all I can speculate is that there may have been an episode of inflammation, which is typical of these cysts. Well, thank you very much indeed. Oui, l'organisme peut être parfaitement naturel. Uh, or, nous ignorons tout de la technologie des extraterrestres. Donc, uh, on ne peut pas définitivement uh, repousser l'hypothèse que ce soit un implant extraterrestre. Although Dr. Patel believes his findings are conclusive, Eric remains unconvinced by such an orthodox diagnosis. And his concerns are shared by implant specialist Dr. Lear. The object is uh, certainly rectangular. Uh, the color is not normal for the skin. Uh, he claims that it has moved. That certainly negates something being a sebaceous cyst. Uh, sebaceous, the word uh, sebaceous comes from the word sebum, which is a gland attached to a hair follicle. And that becomes inflamed and infected, and that's how you get a sebaceous cyst. They would not move from one hair follicle to another. If we got one of these implants and it turns out that it's of, of alien technology, or that it's made of materials that wouldn't be easy to find on Earth, then great, it's a fantastic scientific breakthrough. When dealing with this phenomenon, skeptics argue that the evidence does not exist. Whereas ufologists say the evidence is there, but science just doesn't know how to interpret it. It would seem that without a miraculous breakthrough, there is little chance of either side reaching a common understanding. However, there are a new set of theories developed by the world's leading physicists that believers point to as holding the key to explaining this mystery. A lot of physicists think we're entering a new golden age of theoretical physics. Um, in a way, we're beginning to be able to address questions such as why is the universe here at all? Dr. Brian Cox is a particle physicist who is directly involved with multi-million dollar experiments to find out if the universe could contain hidden dimensions that are still to be discovered. In the last 10 years, theories have been developed where we need other dimensions to explain the way the universe looks to us. So not only three dimensions, up, down and across, and even a fourth one, time, but actually something like 10 or 11 dimensions. That means there's a whole swathe of the universe out there that we really know very little about. Extra dimensions, there could be a centimetre away from my head, an entire universe with, you know, things could live there for all, for all we know. Also, there can be wormholes, so these, these are tunnels in, in space-time. So you could pop into a wormhole at one end of the universe and instantaneously appear at another end of the universe. And those tunnels could even be between one time in the universe to another. So they could, in principle, uh, allow time travel to happen. Now, we don't know whether those things exist or not, but the theory allows them to exist. These theories do not provide any evidence to support the claims of abductees, but they do offer a framework that can explain the universe and our place within it. And perhaps that's exactly what the missing time phenomenon is all about, trying to find a belief system that makes sense of our world and universe. I think your belief system 
plays a part in interpreting, as it were, what you think you've seen. If you see a figure at the foot of your bed, if you're religious, you might think you've seen um, an angel. If, if you believe in the paranormal, you might say you've seen a ghost. If you're a, a ufologist, you might say that's an alien. We live in a culture where it's easier to believe in God. It's saner to believe in a God than it is to believe that there's life on other planets. We have multiple witness sightings of people seeing extraterrestrials and their occupants. That's a no-no. There's a stigma. But if you believe in God, that's okay. I find that very interesting. Most scientists agree that the universe is both old enough and large enough for extraterrestrial life to exist. Whether we've made contact with it yet depends on who or what you believe. Someone doesn't believe Maya's prediction. I'm sorry. It's not my fault. The 4400 Tuesday at 9. And next here on Sky One, we're caught up in a murder. You said we would be safe in Philadelphia. Well, I was wrong. Harrison Ford stars in Witness.